time were some of the real issues affecting SMEs and a way forward. And to help discuss the issue, uh, joining me uh, for the next hour is Mr. Martin George, Chair of the Tobago Business Chamber, and we expect to join us um, a little later on, Mr. Jai Lalodasing, a business consultant and coordinator of the Confederation of Regional Business Chambers. Uh, uh, Mr. George, uh, first of all, uh, good evening and welcome again to the Citizens Community Forum. Yes, good evening to you, Stephen, and good evening to your listeners and to your viewers who may be streaming it live on Facebook. And thank you so much again, um, Sir George, for uh, joining us. Well, you know, we are looking at a couple of things uh, this evening, uh, Mr. George, and um, we, I know that, um, you know, you would have um, a lot to say <laughs> on that announcement um, of the reopening of uh, the, uh, the um, that, that's a very, very critical and important sector. Uh, I think, um, you know, a lot of people are, are looking forward to, um, you know, come uh, on the 16th, is it? Um, we, we do expect, you know, a sort of, a, you know, a, that next level uh, phased, you know, sort of reopening of, of the economy. But but before we get into to those, um, you know, to that, uh, those, those particular areas, Mr. George, um, your assessment um, of uh, our response um, to the pandemic so far, um, we have had, what, um, 15 months uh, of an economic, you know, lockdown, and um, I know that you have also been um, talking about the need for vaccination, but we'll treat with that a little later on. But first of all, uh, as we begin the program, your assessment of our response so far, 15 months on. Well, Stephen, one has to be fair and one has to look at it from a global perspective. And all in all, I will say Trinidad and Tobago has not done badly at all. Okay, we were a small nation and this is th this pandemic is really a moving target. It's it, it's it's a rolling goalpost. So <laughs> the thing is you always have to keep reassessing, readjusting, and maybe tweaking your plans, tweaking your programs, tweaking your objectives, so that way you try to always keep your eye on the ball, so to speak. So I think, I mean, all in all, while there have been, I mean, some glaring missteps, some failures, and, you know, some cases where they literally dropped the ball, like, for instance, in the procurement of vaccines, mm -hmm. I think definitely that was our biggest error, you know, that we, we didn't jump out there early and make sure that we were, you know, first in line, so to speak, to get vaccines. And then, of course, I think there were some errors in terms of the, the PR and the communication aspect where, you know, you saw, you know, um, government officials getting into spats with diplomatic, um, you know, missions. And, you know, that, that kind of thing was just an unnecessary distraction, which I don't think we needed at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, now that we have the vaccines, of course, the challenge is to ensure that we sensitize the population to make them aware of the benefits of it. And I think there again, the government needs to do more. They definitely need to step up the game in terms of the advertising, PR, marketing campaign to get people voluntarily to want to take the vaccine. Because, you know, that's always your first step. And, you know, yes. Stephen, the way I am, I'm always very reasonable. So I always prefer that, you know, you you try to go with the coercion, the gentle persuasion, rather than the big stick approach. Mm -hmm. If, however, you find that nothing else is working, then of course, you know, it's like, um, you know, growing up, you know, your, your parents would sometimes say, you know, if you can't hear, you will feel, so to speak, <laughs> you know. So um, that sometimes might be, you know, your recourse of last resort. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we talk also about um, this issue of hesitancy, and I, I see that word coming up, you know, ever so often when we talk vaccination. Um, when we look at Tobago and, uh, you know, the population, which is much smaller than, than, than Trinidad, um, what do you get as a sense of, you know, when we talk about vaccine hesitancy? Is it that, uh, that people are, are more willing to, to um, you know, to be vaccinated? Or do you find that there is still a sense of, of you know, um, people not wanting to, to rush or be, be pushed, um, as it were, into being vaccinated? I think the vaccine hesitancy is alive and kicking in Tobago. You know, because we've had from the chief secretary, he's indicated that um, at one point there were only 53% of healthcare workers who had received the vaccine, despite them making it available to all of them. So if that has been your response, 
in terms of the voluntary aspect of it. And these are the persons who are at the front line. They are facing the danger every day and they still are resistant, right? You've heard also, they spoke about the teachers, those in the education sector, some of whom they said have not come forth to be vaccinated. And then you, have, you hear the government speaking about reopening schools in September. Yeah. So how is that going to work out if it is that you have teachers who are not taking the vaccine, then what do you leave for the students? Hmm. What do you leave for the parents of those students who may say, look, I mean, if I as a parent, I'm not taking it, I'm not going to let them give my child any vaccine. So, you know, it, it, it creates, I think, a conundrum out of which we may find no avenue except to think of maybe some resort to a legislative solution. But as you say, we'll discuss that at a later point in the program. Mm -hmm. Yes, but y y one, one understands as well, um, Sir George, that um, if we have to talk about the revitalization of business and uh, the very lifeline of uh, especially SMEs, which, as you know, contribute to a large, you know, um, you know a large sector of, you know, of, of, of any economy, um, we would have to, you know, we, we'd have to be talking um, vaccination and, 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 and people, especially for Trinidad and Tobago, um, so that we can find our way out of what, you know, I would term this, um, you know, economic black hole. Yeah, and, and, you know, Stephen, what makes it even more important is the fact that when you think in the scenario of the small business where customers are coming in, they're interacting with the staff, they're interacting with other customers there, I mean, you, you, once you open back up the retail sector, if you are talking large numbers of unvaccinated persons, then you are going to see spikes. And the very thing that the workers and the customers want for business to be reopened, you may very well see the government having to come back out and say, listen, we have to lock down again. And mm. nobody wants that because the thing right. is, there's no business that can survive this boom, bust, boom, bust cycle all the time. Yes. You, mm -hmm. you need some kind of consistency. You need some kind of planning. You need some kind of, you know, stability in terms of your business operations. Yes. So we certainly don't want to see that. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. George, um, the Prime Minister, uh, you know, the Honourable Dr. Keith Rowley was talking about... Um, the amount of uh, money that uh, developed countries have actually poured into, um, you know, in, in, in response to COVID-19 and, um, and, and, and dealing with the pandemic. I wanted to just get a listen to what the Prime Minister said. He spoke about um, countries having to spend some 20% of their GDP. Let's just listen to the Prime Minister and I'll have you respond. The one that struck me was that developed countries have spent 20% of their GDP in responding to COVID. Now, that is a frightening number. So we here in Trinidad and Tobago will have to do the same exercise. We're doing it now, and we will eventually tell you what we come up with for our economy. And I, I was hoping that by now, um, we would have had one of our universities would have had somebody who would have done that. But we do get more echoes than substance. But I would really like to see the, the work done to determine how much, but, but the report coming out of developing countries that some countries have spent up to 20% of their GDP just in responding to COVID. So you can imagine carrying the rest of the country and you add a 20% of their GDP because of COVID, what that would have done to your budgetary planning. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. George, uh, I think the Prime Minister is also hinting at uh, um, of what is to come, because we do have uh, we do have a budget you know, <laughs> that's going to come very shortly. Uh, but but let me have you respond to that before we develop that uh, you know that, that that point further. Well, the the, the fact of the matter is, Stephen, um, one can never you know predict for any you know unforeseen events such as this. So therefore, that's why we have, for instance, the stabilization, the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, mm -hmm. right, which was supposed to be our backup for a rainy day. Well, I mean, this is more than a rainy day. This yeah, is a, indeed. A, a deluge. Indeed, yes. yes, it's a <laughs> deluge, you know. Mm. So the point is, I think it's also by way of explanation for maybe the government's use of that fund. And I think also to tell citizens to brace themselves for even more economic, um, you know, challenges, you know, that's the nicest way I can put it going forward. Now, this does not, 
absolve or exonerate any government from not having a plan otherwise for the economic recovery. So in other words, okay, yes, we're down in a black hole and we may have to, you know, um, dip into our reserves in order to try and keep the ship afloat. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, and that's what I am not hearing from this government at all. I am not hearing, in other words, what is the long-term plan to get us back to a position of economic prosperity because you've heard them they form committees they had the roadmap to recovery committee where everybody i guess maybe sat around um you know and you know they they clinked champagne glasses and you know they they, they probably had lobster and caviar and they mm. wrote a nice report and that then <laughs> seemed to have gone somewhere in a in a in somebody's you know cupboard or or, or in a box under a desk somewhere because you you hear nothing about that anymore mm. and you you wonder okay so where are we going in terms of the short, medium, long-term planning for this country? And that's where the government is, um, you know, abysmally silent. Mm. Because, of course, yes, you fight the fire that is immediately upon you. You deal yes. with that. And, of course, they've been engaged in that. But you, as the leaders, you must have that foresight and vision mm. to start that strategic planning for the future, and that's where I think they have been, you know, woefully short in terms of communicating any plans to the nation in respect of that. Mm -hmm. Mr. George, what I'm also hearing you saying is that um, while we need to have a, a roadmap for economic recovery, we also need to have a road, roadmap, a roadmap for, uh, you know, recovery of the business sector. That's correct. That's correct. And you see, that's the point, because the thing is, the, the, the reality is, Stephen, there are many businesses which will not survive this pandemic. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, businesses go in cycles and economies go in cycles. So we understand that. That's part of life. That's part of how, you know, the, the whole economic um, circle goes. But the point is that you as the government, you from that macro perspective, and, you know, it's a bit... Um, surprising um that's um the nicest way i can put it to hear the prime minister you know basically calling for maybe some assistance from somebody from the university yes. to um he's calling for studies statistics, data plans and i'm thinking but you have an entire central bank with so <laughs> many economists you have so many um financial planners strategists you have actuaries you have all kinds of persons there at the central bank and this is what they should be doing so I don't understand the call for some random person from a university who would not have the data, the resources, the wherewithal, or the means that the central bank is possessed of to be, um, you know, giving you the kind of information that you need to now put an economic plan in place. That's what your central bank is for, because the central bank is supposed to help you start to stabilize and manage your economy in a way that you can now say, okay, all right, so these are the resources I have going forward. This is where I have a shortfall. This is where I need to improve. And therefore, now you come up with a plan. Mm. And that, that's how I thought it would be done. So, okay. um, it again belies the fact of what I just mentioned, that there appears to be no plan that the government has for our medium to long term economic recovery. All right. And, and I will allow you to develop that point a little further on uh, a little later on in the program. Um, let me welcome uh, Mr. Jai Lalodar Singh um, uh, joining us inside the Citizens Community Forum. Uh, good evening to you, sir. Um, good evening. Good evening, Stephen. Uh, my apologies for being late, but I'm happy to join you all. Thank you very much. Martin, good, good night. Jai. It's a pleasure. Right. It's a pleasure. <laughs> a pleasure, Martin. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, um, Jai, you, you had us um, uh, uh, concerned for a while there, um, whether or not you were able to join us. But um, but thank no, no, you all no. the same. Um, we were we were discussing the we are discussing this business of um, SMEs, um, Jai, and uh, we wanted to get you know a perspective as to um, where we are, um, you know where we should be going, and of course you know uh, having a, a, a plan, a recovery plan. Um, let me just bring you in here um, as as you've just um, joined us. Um, where do you see us um, in terms of you know we're talking about the SMEs? Um, where are we now, Jai, from your perspective, and uh, where do you think we need to be going? Um, knowing that um, you know we've had um, some 15 months of an economic lockdown, and the, the um, small and you know medium-sized enterprise sector has been out of commission. 
uh, you know, for the last, what, five, six months. Um, where are we now? Your, your assessment. We are in a very dark place. Um, as Mr. Savidia and I, Paul, wrote in a title of his book, we are in an area of darkness. Now, I want to begin by stating that I do agree with Martin that you have the central bank collecting all this data. And how are you converting this data into value? And he put it succinctly, into a plan. That, that's one important aspect of the central bank. But more importantly, Stephen, is that the government need to bring the chambers into a discussion, a round table, Martin, mm -hmm. with all, all the key stakeholders to give their points at this round table, what is happening, why it is happening, and what we need to do. What are the steps for the future? Now, basically, Steve, man, I'm going to get into the SMEs. Mm -hmm. What is happening is that we are all managing uncertainty. The playbook to manage this pandemic has not been written. We are writing it as we go along, right, Martin? Yes, <laughs> and, and that, yes. Yeah, and, and that is what is happening. But to write it is not just up to one stakeholder alone, which is the government. It is all other stakeholders. It, it is the institutions. It is the business class. Um, yes, you, we have a role to play, the central bank, and um, we need to come together to do a plan for recovery. Mm -hmm. Now, the SMEs. I want to start off by giving some statistics to your listening audience. Um, according to the Ministry of Legal Affairs, there are 28,000 registered businesses in Trent Tobago. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen, bear in mind, this is the formal sector. Right. There is another sector called the informal sector. Informal sector, sector yes. Um, not, much, yeah, not much studies has been done. But there is someone by the name of Dr. Sandra Supram of UE who has done extensive research. Government and private sector need to get their hands on her research, meaning to bring her in as a, as a, in the discussion to find out exactly what is the state of the informal sector. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what. Out of that 28,000 registered businesses, 17,000 belong to the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector. That is absolutely important to note. Um, we at the Confederation did a quick and dirty survey among our 16 different business associations. And in that 16 different, coming, the raw data coming in, it appears that 5,000 businesses approximately will be permanently closed. And more, is, more are going to be closed as, as, as time goes by. Um, this has happened simply because, and you, you gave an accurate timeline of the lockdowns, some of these businesses, Mr. Cummins, need weekly and monthly sales to mm. survive, to That's pay right. employees, That's right. That's to keep right. That's operating. Right. It's, yeah. It didn't happen. And, and Martin, my understanding is very is much harder in Tobago right now. Of and course. all the hotels are closed. Yes. And and you, you're right. dealing with a very small resident population. Yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Small population. 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 Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and, the, and Stephen, the, 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 business, the SME sector in Shawanas, Hoover, um, Gasparillo, Marabella, um, Pinal Davis, it's a community base as well. Point 14. I mean, that, that community needs a lot of help. Fines are bad. Mm. They need a, a lot of help as well. Um, but the thing is, is that their operations were curtailed. This country, Stephen, cannot take a third lockdown. We mm. cannot. <laughs> but but you and, know, and you know, Jai, that, that is what I'm afraid of. That is what I'm really afraid of. Because the thing is, if we don't manage the reopening properly, mm -hmm. and you see, I'm particularly concerned when you talk about schools being fully reopened by October. Yes. That is of concern to me because to me, that is the greatest super spreader event. Mm -hmm. You're talking hundreds of thousands of citizens coming out every day, Monday to Friday, then you think of all the right. transport that yes. is required, all the taxis, the maxi, right. the drivers, the conductors, then the parents who have to drop children back and forth, Indeed. the interactions with people in the PTA, the suppliers to the schools, the teachers, you know, I mean, it is going to be a nightmare if we are not properly vaccinated. There is an interlink, um, because once you talk about school children, you're talking about transportation, you're talking about, you know, so many other linkages. So many other depend. ancillary things, yes. that's correct. You know, the, the, just the people who run in the cafeterias, in the schools, who, you know, serving food, drinks, whatever for the children, you know, those who doing the school feeding, the nutritionists. So, I mean, it, it is wow. It, it, I, I, I am most worried about that if we are not properly vaccinated. And that's, then, you know, the other thing, Jai, much. is if it is that you have parents who are vaccine hesitant or vaccine resistant, then that means for sure they are not going to let you vaccinate their, their, their children. They, they, will, they will resist. 
that, that, that is also true. Um, I just want to touch back on the SME sector, and then we'll, di we'll dive into the whole issue of the, the schools and the public servants and the That's teachers right. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is, is that, um, Stephen, and tell the listening audience, a lot of these businesses are going to remain closed. What, what is going to happen to these people who are unemployed? What is the social dislocation and that is taking place? Now, another thing I want to say, Stephen, is that, yes, we could help these closed businesses reopen. Um, but they're not going to get help from the banks mm. because the banks solely depend on debt financing and an SME could only take so much of debt. They can't go beyond a certain level. Yes. And the resilience is exceedingly limited owing to the SME size. It's not a Neil and Massey or Ansel McCall you're talking about. Mm -hmm. These are very small businesses that employ three to five people running by a husband and wife. It's, yes, it's um, actually tough. Moms and pops. Um, yes, yes. Moms, moms and pops. Is actually tough. And, and I mean, this business is a legacy that they want to leave for their progeny. And, and, and that is what makes it hard. Now, let, let's, let's talk about vaccination in the workplace and then we'll take a nose dive into what Martin described about in the schools. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, these business owners have children going to schools too, Martin, as yeah. well. Yeah. Right? And, and the thing about it is that they know that these business owners know that they have to vaccinate to operate. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just stating what the government has said. Um, and they want to encourage, encourage, I choose my words carefully, Stephen, their employees <laughs> to be vaccinated. <laughs> I heard you this morning, no, that, Jack, that's, that's another discussion, and, huh? That's, that's a, I, I know where you're going, yes. and that's another discussion, but uh, we don't want to be uh, derailed, discussion. you know, from our, from the central points, right. you know, here. Understood. Yeah. So the thing about it is that, right, so you have children going to school. Now, a policy has to be set by the government, some kind of direction. Mm. If children are going to school, this is what is required. Now, Martin and another program this morning was talking about when we were all school children. I mean, we are aged now, Martin, speaking mm -hmm. only for me. But <laughs> we got our typhoid injection, poliomyelitis, yes, um, right. yellow fever, yes. Yes. all the things, mm -hmm. malaria, mm -hmm. right? That's right? Right? Now, I know the AstraZeneca, the Pfizer, the Sinopharm, and Johnson and Johnson are what you call um, emergency use administration. Yes. Um, it, it's not a a fully approved vaccine, but right now is the only defense that we have. Thank you. And that's the point Thank that's you. being made, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. That is yeah. the only defense that we have. Yeah, let me... So, you, know, you, you know, Stephen, sorry, Jai, let me, let me just make this point. You know, it's almost as if, you know, you're in a situation where a plane is about to crash and they're handing out parachutes and you are arguing as to who made the parachute and whether the parachute is good or whether the factory is good or you know what quality at the end of the day you, you, you wouldn't you prefer to jump out with the parachute than with no parachute mm. and that's the simple truth yes yes that's the simplest way you could put it <laughs> all right that's uh, right yeah yeah, Mr. George, I want to stay with you for a little while, and I'll, I'll have uh, uh, Mr. Lalda Singh also respond to this. And um, he made a very important um, point uh, a, a while ago when he was talking about the survival of businesses. Now, um, I heard the finance minister, um, the Honourable um, Colm Ember, talking about um, having found that um, there are a lot of businesses that did not have their, for example, their financials. They were uh, very weak in terms of record keeping. Um, and, and um, you know, he, he came across as though that there was an indictment on, uh, on, on even SMEs, you know, and, and because a lot of people, he said, came for, um, for loans, um, the government offered, uh, you know, there's a loan facility and a lot of them were not able to access because of some basic things that they were not able to provide and, you know, to provide the banks and, and so on. Um, how, do you, how do you respond to such a statement, uh, Mr. George? And uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, I'll have Mr. Lalada Singh uh, respond as well. You know, well, the, the, the reality is, and this has been our experience with a lot of the um, small and medium enterprises in Tobago, um, it, it was exposed starkly mm -hmm. in terms of who was ready and prepared to be able to provide all the statutory documents and show that you are up to date with all your requirements and who wasn't. I could tell you that as a fact, Stephen. And the, it's mainly the larger, more organized businesses and corporations that were ready and they had everything together and the small operators had to start scrambling around. Many of them actually could not meet the requirements because you're talking about years of, you know, statutory obligations that they had not met. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is that we used the opportunity 
to reach out to our members to say, listen, hey, use this as a lesson. You know, Stephen, I always like to look at life in a holistic context. So you, you met a stumbling block here. So next time, make sure you use it as a stepping stone. Mm. Won't let it be a stumbling block a second time around. Mm -hmm. So therefore, get your business in order. Make sure that your NIS, your VAT, your taxes, whatever, make sure all these things are up to date, everything is paid up. Because at the end of the day, Stephen, that is part of the responsibility yes. which helps to build the foundation for a successful and lasting business. Because if you operate in a reckless vikey vi manner where you think that well look i don't have to bother with this i don't have to bother with that then that creeps in to all aspects of your business operations and soon you will just be running helter skelter with no plan no proper direction no you know annual review where you can say well look hey this is what we made for the year. This is our profit. This yeah. is what we're going to put aside as investment. Then, okay, whatever is left, if any, then you could look at that as dividends to be, you know, shared up or, you know, th th it, it requires a certain amount of discipline. Right. You know, one of the things I always tell, um, you know, young attorneys, you know, and I, I tell them, you know, like when they want to go out like in private practice to be a sole practitioner, mm -hmm. I said, listen, you need to understand the most difficult part of the job is learning to manage yourself mm, self -management. as a as a sole trader a sole practitioner a sole businessman a small you know operator managing yourself is the most difficult so in other words you have to be able to self-discipline yes discipline. ah thank you and then everything else will flow from that because your workers will realize hey listen this man is serious he he, he he's not playing mm -hmm. you know it's this way and this is the correct way and we are doing it this way or you have to is you know is, is the highway basically mm -hmm. and that kind of discipline is necessary so i spoke to many of our members and you know i told them i said listen okay all right no sense crying over spilt milk Put your things in gear. Use this opportunity to get yourself in shape so that if ever an opportunity like this comes back around, and you then even prepared, for instance, yes. if you want to go to a financial institution um, for a loan or whatever, they will ask for some of these same documents. All right. So you might as well get them ready and get them in order. Mm -hmm. But right. on the last point I want to make, Stephen, rather than lecturing and hectoring um, you know, the small businessman on these issues, I would have preferred, I would have been happier to hear from the finance minister, him saying, well, listen, we recognize there was an issue and we are providing a solution. We are going to go through the small business development community, um, company and offer more courses, more programs, more assistance for small and medium enterprises. So to help them to get regularized, get organized, get their statutory things in place, show them the importance of, for instance, preparing a proper business plan, yes. show them the importance of having proper accounts, even if it's just a small, you, you, you don't even need to hire an accountant. You could just use an accounting technique Mission mm. to start off if you if you're small okay. or you could keep your own little ledger books you know they could teach you yes. how, and mm. this is how you lead mm. as a government so it's okay. not just that you come down and you criticize and say oh well they weren't ready you know right. oh, that, 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 that's easy to do <laughs> when you when, when you are a man and you are leading as a leader should you want to empower your people so that they can grow it's not just to put them down and criticize them and say, well, they weren't ready um, for what you had for them. So, you know, I, I would have preferred respectfully to see a different approach um, from the minister in that regard. All right. Um, so, Josh, we'll come back to you shortly. Um, uh, Jai, we, we have just about two minutes before we go uh, to the break. And um, uh, I want to have you respond to that very same point. As I said, um, it sounded almost like an indictment on the SMEs uh, that, you know, that these, um, you know, operators did not have their business in order. And, and you know, the government is saying that um, while we are willing to help and while the, the, the financial sector is willing to help the banks and so um, many businesses were not ready. Um, all right, Stephen, I may need a little time after the break to continue to bring my point. <laughs> I can't do it in two minutes, but let me start off by saying, all right. Now, I agree with Martin that people that they have to put their statutory requirements in order mm -hmm. but understand something what is the function of the compliant departments of bir and nib and so forth as well 
Are they are they actually doing their job and going into businesses to ensure a certain level of compliance have taken place? Mm. That, that's the first issue. The second issue is that we are going through a COVID crisis. Businesses on the verge are collapsing, and you are pulling out measures to penalize people simply because over the years you have allowed them mm. not to put certain things in place. Now, these are SMEs. They, they go to the banks with accounts. They may not even be audited accounts, but they still get facilities. Mm. They still get overdrafts. Have still you get uh, developed that point um, further? And um, are you listening to and viewing the Citizens Community Forum? I'm Stephen Cummings. Our topic this evening, Road Ahead for SMEs, the current and post-pandemic. And I have with me Mr. Jai Lutada Singh, business consultant and a coordinator of the Confederation of Region, Regional Business Chambers. Uh, we have also uh, Mr. Martin George, the chair of the Tobago Business Chamber. And uh, we are um, going to come back after the short break. Um, we'll be right back. Join our one-hour current affairs program, the Citizens Community Forum. Topics are wide-ranging and echoes opinions and voices of our society. Whether it be leadership, governance, health, crime, politics, or social issues, we can all have a civil and constructive discussion inside the Citizens Community Forum every Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. on Isaac 98.1 FM with Stephen Cummings. Last week when I heard that there were 16 children sleeping in the cell in a police station, that was something that was unacceptable to me. The current constitution of the Public Services Association, there have been concerns okay. about how well, but if the constitution... Service, if you are restructuring the PSC, the only way you can restructure the PSC is through constitutional reform. If the minister does not accept our request and revalidate this license, we'll have to be headed to court. Every Wednesday, 8 to 9 p.m., the Citizens Community Forum Forum, your host, Stephen Cummings. Our Prime Minister, good evening to you and welcome to the Citizens Community Forum. Good evening, my brother, and all your viewers, listeners. I'm happy to be here with you. You know, our complaints have been more, have been more solid and um, it's, it's, it's been more substance coming forward now. Mr. Cummings, I think you have to not have to be proud of this city and oversight. Mr. Cummings, you are asking about our operational from it. You are asking about it from an operational standpoint, and I think where we stand um, stand out and where we stand apart from other investigative bodies is that we rely um, mostly on, on science. But first of all, good evening, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me on your program, and a very good evening to all of your listeners. Um, it's good to be with you once again. <laughs> And welcome back to the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings, and uh, we are continuing our discussion this evening. I have with me uh, Mr. Martin George, uh, Chair of the Tobago Business Chamber, as well as Mr. Jai Lalada Singh. And uh, we are uh, discussing uh, we are discussing the business of um, the SMEs, um, looking at uh, where we are. Um, as, a, as, as a business sector, um, we are looking at um, uh, you might want to see a roadmap for um, the continuance and uh, the development of uh, the business sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. Jai, um, you, you were making a point um, before we went to the break, and I'll just uh, allow you to finish that off, and um, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Mr. George. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, what I w okay, first of all, my, my designation is that I am the coordinator of the Confederation of Regional Business Chambers. That is 15 different business bodies under one umbrella. Um, why these chambers is autonomous, we speak with one voice. And these are the chambers that are outside for the state. Hmm. San Juan, Tanapuna, 
Sangri Grandi, uh, which is an, under the name of the Eastern Business Merchants Association. Um, we have um, the Gasparillo Marabella Chamber of Commerce, San, Greater San Fernando Chamber, Pinal Debe, Separia, Faisabad, Point Fortin. We have the Yachting uh, Marine Services of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we have the Petroleum Dealers Association, the Petroleum Dealers Cooperative Society, the Canopia Business Association, and we also have the Supermarket Association. Most recently now, the Retailers Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, what I want to say, first of all, is that that SME loan was a poorly designed product, was not even consulted with the private sector or even with us, the Confederation, as to how this would help the SMEs. Mm. It came out as a product based on penalizing people under a COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I agree with Martin. Mm. Compliance is a critical issue that must be adhered to. Mm. I agree. But I ask the question, too, why people must comply? What was the role of the Compliance Department in Inland Revenue? And NIB, were they not supposed to go out to business enterprises and see that they do what is supposed to be done? That there was a lack of enforcement and people continued with what they were doing. I'm not defending it. I'm just calling the situation as it is. What, the minister, what we asked the minister to do is saying, yes, we agree there must be compliance, but these people need assistance as quick as possible. Let us start with ground zero. This is your situation. We will help you on the road to compliance. We will still help you with the facility yes. as you go forward. Mm -hmm. Stephen, for years in Princess Tong, Faisabad, um, Rio Claro, businesses have been getting banking facilities without even full auditing accounts because mm -hmm. there were other things that they had done and they had had a proven track record with the banks. Yeah. Jai, and you, gonna, Jai um, the, I, I think um, you, you might be going into uh, an area there, you know, opening up right. an area there. I, I hope I, that, I, I just, that, I don't, I just <laughs> want to say one thing, Stephen. Yes. Even the bankers were telling their clients, don't take out that loan. Come with us, we'll continue to enhance, um, give you other facilities and so on under normal arrangements. And that is all took place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is how people are accessing money right now. Yeah. I understand that product has been removed off the roster from banks at this point in time. Okay. Well. <laughs> Let me go back to Mr. Mr. George. Is that the same, uh, you know, situation in Tobago um, that, that Jai, uh, you know, has, has described? Well, in terms of the loan facility, I mean, I had a look at it um, on behalf of our members. I, I, I examined it extensively. There were, I think, 33 documents of statutory requirements that you needed to prepare mm. all right either 33 or 36 you know somewhere around there but the point is it was extremely document intensive it was extremely cumbersome difficult laborious time consuming to fill out all the requirements and then when you looked at what was being offered you were being offered a loan for seventy-five thousand dollars, mm. for which the government said the first two years of interest you didn't have to pay back, but thereafter you had to pay back the loan, the principal, mm. the seventy-five thousand yeah. plus the balance of the interest. Mm. So all you were getting was a two-year moratorium on the interest. So I think when one looks at that from a business perspective. I am not surprised that there was a very um, limited uptake because which businessman, when you do the math, does mm. that even make any sense for? And then on top of that, the hoops you had to jump through, you know, I mean, it, it, it was it, it was really extremely onerous. And as I said, I went through every document because there were several of our members who were struggling mm. just to even understand what the requirements were much less to be able to get everything in order and have it ready and to be able to... And then the, the point is some of the information you needed and some of the documents you needed were from the very government departments that were either closed mm -hmm. or they were on very limited operations. Yes. So you had to make an appointment to get, you know, to be able to go in. And then when you go in, nobody's there. So, I mean, it really turned out to be an exercise in frustration for most persons, particularly that $75,000 loan. Um, yes. And then even from an economic perspective, it did not appear to be something that was economically feasible for most persons, um, you know, when they looked at it in the round. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, you're listening to and viewing the Citizens Community Forum. I have with me Mr. Martin George, uh, Chair of the uh, Tobago Business Chamber, and also Mr. Jai Lalada Singh, um, 
from the uh, Confederation of uh, Regional Business uh, Chambers. And um, we are discussing the business this evening of uh, the SMEs, uh, um, looking at where they are, um, where we need to go, and perhaps um, you know, chatting a way forward, um, a roadmap, as it were, for uh, the development and um, you know, resilience and, and furtherance of uh, the uh, small and medium-sized enterprise um, sector. Um, gentlemen, I want us to get a listen. I, I heard um, a comment uh, that was made by um, Dr. Valmiki um, Arjun, a lecturer in finance at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and um, he was talking about the impact of the pandemic on trade, business, and investor confidence in Trinidad and Tobago. Let's just get a listen, and um, we will um, we'll have you I'll have you comment on on that. We are still finding some serious supply chain problems happening globally, where, for example, if you're involved in, in, in manufacturing activities, they're finding it quite difficult to still acquire raw materials on time, the equipment on time to be able to facilitate their production operations in, in, in order to meet whatever orders they may have. And the reason is this, because of that pent up demand that we're finding globally, for example, in China, their manufacturing activities would have grown by about 38.6% just in the space of one month. And the reason for that is because they're getting some, some very large purchase orders from across the world, particularly from those countries that were able to, to reopen uh, their economies. But suppliers can only meet a particular percentage. Of course, um, you know, we have also been talking about, um, you know, the impact on, on when we look at uh, trade and, um, you know, how Trinidad and Tobago has been faring there as well. Um, I just want to get some quick responses um, from, uh, from you both on th that particular point. Um, when we look at trade, um, you know, how have we been uh, faring? Uh, and, and what are some of the, the maybe the, the obstacles? And um, I, I, we, we do have, you know, uh, maybe about five minutes again, uh, gentlemen, uh, would you believe time is going by so quickly? Uh, <laughs> if I could just have you both uh, respond to that. And, and uh, maybe we can touch this quickly as well on the ease of doing business. Um, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Um, Lalada Singh. Okay. Um, first of all, I do agree with Dr. Arjun. The global supply chains are being compromised. Even freight charges have gone up by 100% in some cases, 150 to 200%. This is going to affect the price. Let me begin with food, and that will bring a crisis here. Because if food cannot be obtained by our consumers and our working class people, then the country is in deep trouble. Bringing in other materials that is needed, let's say construction materials, I understand that has also gone up 100% as well. Yes. And it's going to be climbing higher. We have to find a way to address the whole issue of the global supply chains understand what is causing it and understanding how to deal with it. Now, a, someone, a friend of mine from the business community sent me um, a presidential notice from the office of the president of Guyana that he is also trying to reduce freight, um, certain rates and customs charges so that that will ease up um, the global um, pricing issue for Guyanese businessmen that are confronting these, these, these overwhelming challenges. We have overwhelming challenges here already, both of a financial nature, custom charges, customs over time, yes. um, de demerit charges, and the whole issue of the inefficiency of the customs and excise itself. Hmm. I mean, we see the serious customs and excise reform in this country. Hmm. And again, that takes a whole, Martin can emphasize on that, <laughs> but that takes a whole special majority in parliament. And right now, where you have um, an estranged relationship between government and opposition, I don't know how possible it is. That may not but happen anytime soon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, let me, yeah. Let me go quickly over to Mr. George. Mr. George, um, time is running away with us. Um, yes, yeah, You sure. can just um, uh, respond to yeah. that in two minutes. And um, if you can as well touch on the ease of doing business. I don't know how much we can. That's, that's right. a whole other uh, yes, discussion. Even, but let's see how quickly know, we can uh, go Interestingly, that. one of the fundamental problems in terms of the global supply chain is a shortage of containers. Would you believe that is a fundamental problem for the shippers? Because what has happened is that you have lots of containers which are sitting in warehouses, but because of lack of staff, because of the shutdowns and slowdowns with COVID, they were not unstuffed. 
So you have containers sitting there with goods. They have not been returned empty, so therefore they can't be used again until they are unstuffed. And that is part of a problem. So can you believe something as basic as that? Mm -hmm. There's also the question of space on ships in terms of the cargo ships. And it has reached a situation now where persons are being charged a premium in order to get their containers on ships. I, I know for a fact some importers in Trinidad and Tobago, you have to pay like a surcharge just to get your... So this is on top of all your freight charges, your CIF charges, everything. You have to pay a surcharge just to make sure your containers get on the ship. So it, it's really a crazy scenario. And then you add to that the fact that they are now demanding for local business persons that they pay in U.S. and they pay upfront in U.S., even when the um, freight lands in Trinidad, they are demanding payments in U.S. The, the, the international shippers are demanding. So all the local fees that you used to pay in TT dollars, mm -hmm. they are now demanding U.S. dollars. And this is in a situation where the foreign exchange crisis is fully upon us. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is, we, we're in, we're in a, a, a whirlwind. And that's why I'm saying, Stephen, we really need some clear guidance and direction from the government in terms of what's the long-term plan. We know we're in a dark place, but we need you to be able to show us the light and show us, well, okay, we're heading in that direction. We don't want to end up like the Israelites wandering for 40 years in the desert and making no progress whatsoever. Okay. We need a Moses to lead us out of this situation. All right. I, I, I agree with Stephen. I'm with Martin. Yes, gentlemen, I think we have to leave it there at the moment. Time has uh, just, you know, um, ran away with us. And um, I will take that which you've said there as your closing remarks uh, because, of, <laughs> because of all, you know, constraint of time. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much again for, uh, you know, for being with us and um, on the Citizens Community Forum. I, I get the sense that we'll have to continue this discussion um, uh, because there's so much more that we haven't, you know, um, touched on, we haven't gone into. But I'm sure we'll have another opportunity at another time. Uh, thank you so much again for joining it's us. It's indeed a pleasure. Thank you. It's indeed a pleasure. Thank Stephen, you, my yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And Steve, my apologies for jumping in late, but I'm happy with the discussion. A nice to reconnect with Martin. Thank yes, you. thanks. Yes, thank you again, gentlemen. Uh, talk right. with you soon. Okay. And uh, you're listening to and uh, viewing the Citizens Community Forum and with Stephen Cummings. And uh, we were talking um, this evening uh, about um, SMEs, uh, the small and enterprise uh, sector, um, road ahead for SMEs current and post pandemic. And uh, with me, my two guests, um, Sajai Ladadar Singh, business consultant and coordinator of the Confederation of Re Regional Business Chambers. And of course, Mr. Martin George, chair of the Tobago Business Chamber. And that's it for this evening inside the Citizens Community Forum, part two, Road Ahead for SMEs Current and Post-Pandemic. I'm Stephen Cummings. See you next Wednesday. It was a famous poet who once said, They came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Words there from famous poet Martin Nimelor, 1892 to 1984.